Hey everybody, welcome to this free edition of our Trader User Group. This is the weekly roundup for the trading week ending July 17th, 2020. I'm Preston Brent. Thanks for tuning in. Remember folks, don't be a rat brain trader. We all want to be the red stripe zebra and this week's theme is all aboard. Well, let's just kind of break this thing down and see what the markets are really doing and where they really want to go. So first of all, let's just kind of look at how we did for this past week. If we look at the U.S. Uh, index performance, you can see that the um, uh, markets were fairly uh, uh, okay for the week with the exception of the NASDAQ. It was a rare week in which we saw NASDAQ fall 1.08%. But the other markets, Dow, S&P, and Russell, Russell had a very big week, 3.56%. Year to date, you guys can still see that the NASDAQ is leading the way <clears throat> up a little over 17%. Now, if we look at the sector performance for the, uh, this past week, materials had the best week, up 5.7%. The worst week, a surprisingly bringing up the rear, was technology at <laughs> 1.82%. Now, if we look at the world markets and just kind of see where they fared, you can see across Europe, everything was in the green. Both the um, FTSE CAC 40 and the DAX were up nicely. Over in Asia, we had China and Hang Sen uh, kind of pulling back, which was a little surprising, although the prior week, China was up over 7%. So kind of digesting some of that move was good. Um, but we do see that um, overall for the week, it was a fairly nice week with a little bit of sector rotation going on, which I'll talk about that. Uh, in a minute. Now, as far as U.S. valuations go, they're continuing to stretch. We can see the P.E. ratio. The 12-month trailing is 29.34. The Ford P.E. ratio is 25.87. That's lower by about 11.82%. But even 25.87, some people argue that the valuations are stretched. But keep in mind, with the 10-year Treasury yield sitting at 0.628 or 62.8 basis points, and the S&P dividend yield sitting at 1.9%. You know, we're showing a spread of about 1.27%. So that still encourages money to flow into the uh, markets. Okay. <clears throat> now, if we just take a look at what came up this week, you know, let's first talk about the uh, uh, technology shares in a rare miss for the week. I mean, we saw the S&P up for its third consecutive week, right? In fact, it reached intraday levels not seen since the market sell-off in late February. We actually made, we actually took out the pivot point that was made um, uh, uh, last month. So that was good. You know, we also saw a shift, as I said, some of the uh, higher valuation growth shares kind of came in a little bit. We saw the tech heavy NASDAQ pull back a little bit and we saw some market rotation, you know, into some of the smaller cap as evidenced by the uh, NAS, uh, the Russell moving up over three and a half percent for the week. <clears throat> OK, now we also one of the interesting things that's noted is the NASDAQ on Monday. <clears throat> We've seen a huge gap in the performance this past week. Actually, the, the, we saw the uh, NASDAQ and NSP. The gap between the two was about 2.3%. That's the widest gap we've seen since 2016 in the underperformance. And the last time that happened, uh, it's been a, quite some time. You know, the market's going forward. NASDAQ perf underperformed for a while. And looking at the NASDAQ 100, which is 100 of the largest companies, tech companies in NASDAQ itself, on Monday, it was actually up 2%, and it finished the day down more than 2%. A huge reversal, huge move. We have That's only happened nine other times in history of the NASDAQ, just nine times. And the other times when it's happened, we've seen NASDAQ lose on average four, almost almost four and a half percent over the following 90 day or three month period. So, again, that would make sense with technology being on such a tear this year. You know, it's already up 17 percent for the year. So having NASDAQ pull back makes sense. But remember, because they've been leading the way, they've kind of held the other markets up a little bit. So unless the sector rotation continues, the pullback in NASDAQ is going to tend to weaken some of the other um, uh, sectors in the markets. The other thing is we saw earnings kick into gear last week with big banks. They reported their earnings. Uh, this coming week, we'll see about 32 of the S&P 500 companies report earnings. Um, we've seen um, 
the big banks, these big money center banks this past week set aside up to $28 billion in loan loss reserves for loans. So that seems to indicate that the consumer spending may kind of settle in a little bit. Okay. <clears throat> So we could see uh, uh, the markets, everything is setting up, as I've been saying here in these updates for the past couple of weeks, for a little bit of a pullback going towards the end of July into the month of August. Um, to me, it would not be surprised to see the S&P pull back 100, 200 points easily. Okay. Um, the other thing is FactSet came out with some of their expectations for earnings and for the S&P 500, they're forecasting a contraction of 44% for this quarter relative to a year ago. Now that's good because the lower the bar, the better it is to be and keep uh, price action where it is. But we're gonna kinda see how this thing fares itself out. The other thing is we got prox uh, we saw a lot of progress in vaccines on the vaccine front. I mean, after close on Tuesday, we saw the markets gap up with Moderna. You know, they announced this um, a vaccine that produced high levels of antibodies in all test participants. So they're going to be expanding their study to over 10,000 folks. We also got AstraZeneca uh, in partnership with another company um, producing not only antibodies, but um, uh, other things that can uh, prolong the immunity of uh, COVID. So that's coming up. Um, so all of that for near-term price action is good. But another wild card in the markets, which is, you know, acting um, this way as a um, potential drag on uh, markets is uh, school openings or lack thereof, right? It's estimated that I think about a third of the workforce has child or kids in school. And should many of these schools fail to reopen, we're going to see more stay-at-home folks, parents, and that's going to reduce basically the overall back to workforce kind of thing as we head into the end of this year. That's also going to affect, you know, the big, large back to school retail spending, although retail sales came in really strong. But that was because of the um, unemployment checks that everybody's getting, which is due to end uh, the end of this month. But that is another wild card where I, I believe uh, the Republicans and Democrats, there's just going to be too much pressure on They're going to come out with another stimulus package of a trillion to a trillion and a half. So they're going to extend these benefits. So we're going to see the markets react favorably to that, I suspect. Now, <clears throat> inflation and inflationary data this past week also remained well below the Fed's 2% annual target, all right? although we did see a spike in gas prices in June. But basically, uh, the um, uh, CPI reading, excluding food and energy prices, is only at about 1.2% for a 12-month period. Okay? The Feds want to see it at 2%. And the Feds are pretty much on record as saying we're going to see these low interest rates at least for the next year or two. So that's going to keep pressure on big money to find a home in the equity markets, which kind of supports the equity markets. And if you throw on top of that, um, the fiscal stimulus is, that should hit the wires end of July into early August, then I think that's going to provide, um, you know, buyers, more buyers willing to step in. I do believe we should have a little bit of a pullback, but that's just going to be an opportunity for buyers to step back in. All right. The other thing that we saw is we got the first pass of China GDP. China GDP came in at 3.2% which was higher than expectations. Um, and it reversed a huge historic 6.8% contraction in Q1. Now we're going to have a huge drop in our Q2 uh, GDP when that hits the end of this month, we get this. But the, the again, the bar is very low. We're forecasting a very low uh, negative number, which would put us in an official recession, but we've been in a recession for a while. Um, but anyway, uh, China tends to lead the global recovery as well as uh, forecast when it's going to pull back. So this huge rebound, this initial pass in Q2 could be good longer term. But near term, chop is going to stay. Volatility is going to stay. And then finally, before we get into the charts, I'm, you know, some of these big indexes, it's looking like Tesla could be added, not guaranteed, but could be added to the S&P this year. And that'd be a big win for the car maker. And it would also bring more money into the stock, even though it's as high as it is. You're going to see mutual funds are going to need to add Tesla to its holdings in order to maintain their performance levels against the overall benchmark. So that net net is going to be a positive. 
So what I want to do now is just shift the screen and let me just take you over to um, <clears throat> Uh, the E-mini S&P 500 futures. So let me just get it over here. And what I'm going to show is a clean view of the screen. Um, and you're going to just see here what this is going to be is just the chart with the Ichimoku on here. And it's going to be a 240 minute chart. You can see here that uh, we actually back here um, on the 15th, we actually made, uh, we, we took out the prior pivot highs. Okay. If I were to Let's just see if I get this on the screen right here. You can see we actually just moved above this prior pivot high just by a couple of uh, ticks. Um, and that's a good thing, okay? You can see the Ichimoku cloud below. Uh, you can see the red line above the blue line, all right? For those of you Ichimoku uh, um, uh, folks out there that know that, that, that's the 9 SMA over the 26 SMA. That would be the Tenkan Sen over the Kaijun Sen. Um, and keep in mind, these are not typical moving averages. They're volatility adjusted, all right, the way they calculate them. In our option masters, I go through a, a really good way to use the Ichimoku with options. It works out fairly well. Um, and you can see here we're also completing a 345 Elliott Wave pattern on this 240-minute bar chart, uh, which is kind of my infrared view of a daily chart. And if I put the MACD down below, you can see here that it's it's <laughs> been setting up for this uh, kind of rolling uh, bearish divergence kind of thing. So that tells me that we're we're susceptible to a pullback, okay, of at least a hundred points back down to the cloud area down here. Now, should that cloud area break, it's going to go a little bit further. And if I take you over to a daily chart, but just a different view, um, and we look at this here, you can see. Uh, going back to the beginning of April, right here, let's just put it on the beginning of April, since we started that big move higher, you can see we made new all-time highs, all it doesn't look like it, we just did just by a couple of ticks, you can see on the MACD here, we do have a um, possible bearish divergence setting up, if that thing clicks lower, now I've always said, now these are simple moving averages they're not exponential where the 50 crosses the 200 that is just a magic marker where price action loves to revisit and that puts us around 3025 remember we're at 3213 now so it's about 80 or 90 points south of the current price but if we get down here that'll be testing the 200 and it's not a very far move down to the 2930. Remember, I had our members uh, getting into puts back over here on June the 5th. And then sure enough, we came down and hit my first target, which was this yellow uh, circle right here. My first target was the FIB extension of 61.8. And we came down and just kissed it intraday. And then we moved back up. Very strong reversal. We came back down and we did the natural retest. And now we've just been moving up here. OK, um, we're going to find right now that markets are going to be heavily handed here coming into next week. We're going to get earnings Monday. We get IBM Tuesday. We get Texas Instrument um, Wednesday. We get Microsoft and Tesla. So we're starting to get some of the tech companies uh, next week and the week after we get some of the bigger ones. We also get Twitter and Intel on Thursday. We finish out the week with our first big oil company, Schlumberger, uh, on Friday. So we're going to start to see these tech uh, companies, uh, you know, show us what they've got here. And then what I've been telling our members is that, you know, doing some spreads up here like bear call spreads, these kind of things makes a lot of sense to me. The wild card in all this, as I said, are a couple of things. One is the vaccine. Because if a vaccine comes out, you're going to see stocks move very strong. And members, we've got a watch list of things that we're playing. I came out with a watch list for our members uh, in March as we were crashing. And then the end of March, early April, I had our members getting into, there was about 10 stocks that were due to really just, just blow the socks off. And they did, right? One of them that I mentioned here was copper. Um, and I'll show you that chart in a minute, but we've done fairly well with those stocks. And now that they've moved up pretty good for those that wanted to stay in, um, we've hedged them with, with, um, uh, options. Okay. Now you can also see in here, I got volume over price. So that purple over here just shows huge amounts of volume sitting under this 78.6 fib node here. Okay. And I told our members, if we 
take out 78.6 we're going to take out this 3236 which is what um which is what we did we took out that high point here and we are this prior pivot high right here uh and we moved up just a little bit right i mean we moved up uh, to uh 3325 so which was slightly in the red for the year but we're pretty close that blue line is the price of the red green divider for year to date in the green year to date in the red okay but we took out that prior pivot which is a small win all right for the markets so that's a little bit about where we're sitting here and then of course if i put it on nasdaq on nasdaq i've got a different view i've got a fib retracement on nasdaq okay and if we come back to uh, early april again you can see the volume over price and you can see these areas where volume has been strongest right i mean it's very apparent right in this area here so it's buyers and sellers duking it out right in this area here i suspect um, NASDAQ the propensity will be and you'll see there's very little volume here so there's very little holding this up should it come back you'll see buyers waiting in the wings down here at the two three point six fib retracement okay now I'm using retracement on NASDAQ versus the extensions on the fib for S&P and you can see this move right here I suspect to me, it be if we get that 150 point pullback, 200 point pullback in S&P, I feel confident that the Nasdaq will come back in this area here, and then we'll start to see buyers come in. Remember when Nasdaq really was on this tear up here? It was over two and a half, almost three standard deviations above the 50 simple moving average, and well north of the 200. And Generally, when that happens, price action kind of stalls out and waits for the moving averages to catch up a little bit, or it even pulls back to close the gap. There is no divergences in NASDAQ, so that tells me that when NASDAQ pulls back, buyers, especially down in this area down here, are going to be really ready to just jump in and buy the hell out of this. You can see my longer-term target here. As we go through uh, August, September, October time frame is around 11,006 for uh, NASDAQ 100. But we got to have a little bit of a pullback and, and then uh, just attract uh, the buyers more because the higher it goes without any kind of pullback, you're going to see uh, the air get thinner and thinner and less participation. A pullback will bring the bulls in. That's why you probably hear the term. A little bit of a pullback is really good for the market. So that's kind of where we're sitting. Um, from that perspective. Now, what I want to do is I'm going to show you uh, uh, volatility here. Let me just take it over to the VIX. I got to move my screen around just a little bit, kind of show you where we're where we're sitting here. So let me just move this this over here like this. I've got 12 monitors, so it's gonna. I just have to with WebEx. It's interesting how I gotta. It's like driving a car with your rearview mirror as you're moving these screens around. So as this green paints up, you're going to see a daily chart of the VIX, and you're going to see the high point of the VIX right over here uh, was on March 18th, even though the lows were made on March 23rd. The high point here intraday was 85.47, okay? Um, and then, as I told our members, we're probably not going to revisit that again, even if we go and take out those March 23rd lows, because at the time, we didn't know if we were going to do that or not. Um, and then in early um, April, I had our members getting long some key stocks, and we've basically been playing them since, okay? Uh, now you can see these colors on here. That's black, red, kind of a light red, rose color, yellow, and green. And these are just different strategies that I like to use, and I work with our members on based on where the VIX is, right? Uh, it's just kind of a color-coded, nice way of showing you where we're where we are in a zone, in a volatility zone, and what we can expect from options. You can see here this week the VIX came in and closed the week at 25.68. So that's where we're sitting now. But notice we're going to stay elevated. I mean, even though we're in uh, uh, July, right, going into the middle of July, and the the peak of vol was on March 18th. Um, I believe we're going to stay elevated all the way through summer months into the election season. There's just too much going on here and there's such a wide uh, 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 
uh, variable in where the markets can go, depending on whether we get a vaccine or not, depending on whether all the schools open or not, depending on the caseload and the death rate and the reopening or lack thereof of the economy. It's just a wide range of options. And either one of them, you could make a bearish or a bullish case for all. So, and this is where we benefit really well because we're not really trying to guess what's going to happen because believe me, you're just guessing. And if someone tells you they know where the markets are going to go, they don't. Not with these wide variables and wide range of outcomes. What we're doing is we're playing key price action moves and we're marrying that with certain option strategies that leverage the volatility in those asset classes that we're trading. And that tends to work out very well. Now, just one little uh, trick I'll show you guys is if we look at the, and I show this a little bit, um, if we look at the SKUs, right, if we look at the back month SKU, um, you can see on the back month SKU, we're in the green. So we're in contango. So that shows the back month is August and September, which basically means that August is higher than the September or the September volatility futures are higher than the August volatility futures. That means things are starting to settle down out in time. If we look at the front month SKU, which is the VIX, compared to July, which is going to expire fairly soon, you can see we're still in the green. So the term structure of volatility has settled down a little bit. Okay, We were in the red, which meant there's more fear in the markets, and we've settled back into the green. And if we look at the back month again, which is the August, September of all futures, you can see how, you know, ever since that move or lower uh, in uh, the second week in June, the, the volatility just slowly slid back down again. Now, one other little trick I'll show you is if we look at the uh, volatility of NASDAQ, minus the volatility of the VIX, okay? And then we take a look at this. Anytime we get up over uh, a high rate here, anytime we get over five or six, and I'll mark the chart, then that's not a good thing for NASDAQ. And because NASDAQ has been leading the way, then um, that's kind of a early warning signal that we could expect a little bit of a move back uh, in, in NASDAQ. Uh, and you can see it right here. Now, remember, this is not NASDAQ volatility. It's a comparison of the VIX to NASDAQ, okay? And when we get elevated like this, it's not a good thing. Members, there's another little uh, thing I'll show you in here on how we can use this to help kind of gauge market action and market movement. But these are just what you need to understand, especially if you're trading options in these markets, especially with vol, even though it's come in a little bit, we're still elevated. I mean, the volatility uh, is still, it closed the week at 25.68. And in most normal times, 25 would be a very high vol. Because remember, we lived for a year or two with vol at 11 and 12. So we're still elevated, even though it seems a lot more quiet it's, there's still an elevation to it. And if we look at the bond market, you know, 14 ticks down, but look at this. Bonds have been in this tight range for quite some time. If we get that move lower, bonds are going to move up here. And every time bonds moves up, which means interest rates move down, um, I'm more willing to short bonds, okay? <clears throat> because that just tell or go long interest rates because um, if bonds are moving up here like this the feds basically are, are not buying a lot of the uh, front end of the curve they're buying more of the back end of the yield curve more of the longer duration bonds and that keeps inflation in check um, that keeps interest rates in check and that's what they're doing right now it's kind of an uh uh, a market that's that is just really not going much of anywhere. If we look at the interest rates, especially the ten-year, which drives the mortgage market. By the way, the mortgages this past week just came down to 2.98. First time in the history of the mortgage market, it's gone below three percent, at least since they've been tracking it. But you can see interest rates have just been trading in a very tight range, right? So there's going to be some great trades out of this as markets start to make a move. And what I'm talking about is a move up and then we short it or a move down and we go long. We're going to be the red stripe zebra in this always. Um, and it really helps us as markets return back to a mean 
uh, driven uh, area. Right now, the feds are in it and they're manipulating the market a pretty good little bit, as you can see with some of these charts. Um, <clears throat> a lot of action going on in the currency market at this time. I think longer term, the dollar is going to continue to unwind. You can see it's below the 29 closing price right here. We're well outside of our, our channel in which it was moving up. Um, and you can just see uh, these are daily bars day after day and then this this uh, move higher it's going to come back down here and then we'll probably get a final move up uh, and then another roll lower so any uh, rise in the US dollar is going to be met by um, sellers coming in and a better place to be would be in the euro and you can play the euro with uh, options. You can see almost like a cup and handle kind of pattern. It's setting up for a divergence, which I would not be surprised to see the euro pull back. But then you're going to see buyers step in on the euro. We had the cross again in the 50 and the 200 SMA. And typically price action loves to hit that cross. So depending on how much of a pullback we've got is going to be uh, and how it affects Europe. Uh, in the U.S. markets. Remember, it's not the dollar, it's the dollar index. And the dollar index is driven by the cross country, the cross currencies, the euro, the yen, pound, Canadian dollar, Swedish krona, Swiss franc, so forth. The euro is about almost just slightly under 58% of the dollar index, 57.6 to be exact. The yen's about 13.6%. And the British pound is 11.9. You add all that up, <clears throat> And you're at what, almost 90, 88, 90% of the value of the dollar index. So the dollar index moves in relation to where those guys want to go. Okay. And right now, Europe wants to move higher. Uh, and, the, and, and the euro wants to move higher. And it wasn't, I mean, just as May, we, in May, ba basically the middle of May, the euro was down around 1.07. It's moved up seven cents to the dollar. Folks, that's a huge move in the currency market. Huge. Um, and we're seeing some of this through manipulation with the feds and what they're doing. But uh, and that's why you probably see talking heads on TV saying emerging markets in Europe may be a better investment over the next 12 months or just add a little bit more weighting to that. Um, and a way to do that with members with you guys, I'll go through it with you this weekend uh, on our weekly market watch this Sunday on ways to make that play. Gold, I've been saying this also. Gold is, is stuck in this range right here, like it was stuck in this range. Now it's going to be in this range for a bit. Butterflies, iron condors in the gold futures market, these are great things that you may want to be considering right now because they're just, it's stuck. It'll move up and down a little bit, but it's going to be stuck in this range until you've got a breakout. With gold, ratio diagonals and, and uh, unbalanced flies would be a perfect way to trade this. We'll go through this again in our... Um, uh, uh, Sunday night session here uh, coming up uh, for our weekly market watch. If we look at the oil markets and energy, oil is stuck, you know, right around that 40 area. I mean, look at the tight range of oil as the markets get balanced. Again, in the oil market, balanced iron condors um, are, are a really good trade. Uh, balanced flies uh, where you can easily adjust up or down makes a lot of sense to me in these kind of markets. Okay. Well, one thing I forgot to talk about, um, I've had our members play silver more so than gold. And the reason why is the silver to gold ratio got really out of whack. So on a relative basis, silver outperformed gold and Playing silver long was, you know, a better performer on a percentage return on invested capital than gold. That was just one little thing, um, you know, I had our members doing. The other one, and I think I mentioned this here, is playing copper, okay? We got into copper in um, uh, early April. And we've just been riding copper all along the way. Many of our members took copper futures. Some took uh, Freeport McMoran, <clears throat> which is um, FCX. I called it out here with you guys, too. I think some of you have taken it because I've gotten some emails from you, so you're welcome. But it's been a double, more than a double in this thing. Um, and if we look at Freeport McMoran, uh, let me just find that on here. Where is that sucker? Uh, it's on the, it would be in the metals right here, FCX. 
you can see here we got in in the in the low sixes and now it's sitting at 1358 so that's a that's that's more than double uh an easy run and copper is also being helped not only by china and the strength in china with their 3.2 percent gdp first pass number at q2 is that the COVID has closed down some of the copper mines so it's reduced the inventory levels of copper so that's even sped up i mean look at this i mean this thing has just been blasting higher I mean, it was it was sitting around um, 10.5 uh, towards the end of June, and now it's 13.5 the middle of July. So in about three weeks, it's moved up a little over 50 cents. That's a lot for copper. Um, 50 cents on a 10.50, you know, uh, uh, stock. That's a good move, guys. Um, so you, you, we're seeing this just play itself out. And if you're playing options on it, that's even a better run. Okay. So this is kind of what we're seeing here for members uh, this Sunday evening. We'll go through some stocks, some other stocks that I see that we can add to our list. Now, remember, we got the election silly season that's going to officially crank off probably around the end of August going into September. And then we got September and October. We'll make a list of those stocks that'll fare well if uh, Biden comes in victorious or those that'll fare well if Trump comes in. And no matter your proclivities and who you want to see win, we're in it to make money. So we're going to play whoever looks like they're going to win. And remember, uh, the polls, they don't work out. We've got to follow price action because price action is probably a better gauge than you know what the polls are going to say. All right, everybody, that's kind of where we're sitting right now for this weekly roundup. Members, I will see you this Sunday evening at 8 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Everybody else, love to see you come in and join us. Have a great weekend, everybody. Ciao now.